Good evening, everyone, brothers and friends from all over the state of Kentucky, the United States of America, from all over the world, for that matter, for taking time out of your lives this evening to gather together for online friendship and brotherhood as we continue to remain committed and diligent to our fraternal bonds together in Freemasonry. It is the pleasure and honor of Lexington Lodge Number no. 1 and the Rubicon Masonic Society to unite us together this evening for what is the fifth part of our 10-part virtual Masonic education series. We're halfway through, brothers. My name is Brian Evans. I'm the master of Lexington Lodge No. 1 and chairman of the Rubicon Masonic Society, both of which are located in Lexington, Kentucky. And I encourage you that if you are ever in this area, our door is always open. We would love to see you. Alongside my good friend and past master of Lexington Lodge No. 1, worshipful brother, Dr. John W. Bizak, who is also the vice chairman of the Rubicon Masonic Society, we are humbled and honored to be just a small part in your thirst for, ed for additional knowledge in your individual and collective Masonic journeys. So far, over 311 men have RSVP for this 10 part series since we launched on May 4th. As a result of the social and Masonic distancing that this global pandemic, COVID-19 has caused in our lodges and in our lives. We sincerely hope and pray that everyone is staying healthy and safe during this stressful time, that your lives can begin to get back to normal as businesses are beginning to reopen, and that this education tonight brings you just a little bit of internal and Masonic happiness. Brothers and friends, I will now begin by calling this virtual education meeting to order. And what we have done so far, and like we will continue to do for the duration of this series, I will begin with a short video poem to get our minds set on the matter at hand this evening. The poem is called, When is a Man a Mason? by Joseph Fort Newton. When is a man a mason? by Joseph Fort Newton. A man is a mason when, when he can look out over the rivers, the hills, and the far horizon with a profound sense of his own littleness in the vast scheme of things, and yet have faith, hope, and courage, which is the root of every virtue. When he knows that down in his heart, every man is as noble, as vile, as divine, as diabolical, and as lonely as himself, and seeks to know, to forgive, and to love his fellow man. When he knows how to sympathize with men in their sorrows, yea, even in their sins, knowing that each man fights a hard fight against many odds. When he has learned how to make friends and to keep them, and above all, how to keep friends with himself. When he loves flowers, can hunt birds without a gun, and feels the thrill of an old forgotten joy when he hears the laugh of a little child. When he can be happy and high-minded amid the meaner drudgeries of life. When star-crowned trees and the glint of sunlight on flowing waters subdue him like the thought of one much loved and long dead. When no voice of distress reaches his ears in vain and no hand seeks his aid without response. When he finds good in every faith that helps any man to lay hold of divine things and sees majestic meanings in life, whatever the name of that faith may be. When he can look into a wayside puddle and see something beyond mud and into the face of the most forlorn fellow mortal and see something beyond sin. When he knows how to pray how to love and how to hope. When he has kept faith with himself, with his fellow man and with his God, in his hand a sword for evil, in his heart a bit of a song, glad to live but not afraid to die. Such a man has found the only real secret of masonry and the one which it is trying to give to all the world. Brother Don Combs, Junior Warden of Lexington Lodge Number 1. Brother, will you please deliver the opening charge for our friends and brothers this evening? 
The ways of virtue are beautiful. Knowledge is attained by degrees. Wisdom dwells with contemplation. There we must seek her. Let us then, brethren and friends, apply ourselves with becoming zeal to the practice of the excellent principles inculcated by Freemasonry and the good in our hearts. Let us ever remember that the great objects of our association are the restraints of improper desires and passions, the cultivation of active benevolence, and the promotion of correct knowledge of the duties we owe to God, our country, our neighbors, and ourselves. Let us be united and practice with diligence the tenets of Freemasonry and our religious beliefs. Let us all let all private animosities, if any unhappily exists, give place to affection and brotherly love. It is a useless parade to talk of the subjection of irregular passions within this meeting if we permit them to triumph in our interaction with others. Uniting in the grand design, let us be happy ourselves and endeavor to promote the happiness of others. Let us improve in everything that is good, amiable, and useful. Let the good of Freemasonry and our religious beliefs preside over our assembly and under her intentions. Let us act with poise, dignity, and as gentlemen in our labors to become better men. Thank you, Brother Junior Warden. Brother Bob Heater, Chaplain of Lexington Lodge Number 1, will you please deliver the opening devotion to our friends and brothers this evening? First, unmute yourself, sir. Let us pray. Eternal God, Grand Architect, he who grants every good and perfect gift. We thank you that Freemasonry is a fellowship. How grateful we are for the fraternal union we experience when we gather together as observant Masons. Guide us this evening as we seek to conduct our affairs in ways which will benefit the spread of Masonic knowledge and light. Thank you for giving inspiration to those who planned and are participating in this evening's Masonic activity. Amen. So mode it be. So mode it be. Thank you, Brother Chaplain. Brothers and friends, the agenda this evening is as follows, very similar to what we've done in the past. In a moment, I will briefly outline the purpose, the protocol, the recommendations of these meetings. We will then proceed directly into our education with an excellent guest speaker whom Dr. John W. Bizak will introduce for us momentarily. Following the presentation, we will have a live question and answer session for our presenter. We will then enjoy a bit of music to help us reflect on those things for which we are individually and collectively grateful for in our lives. Following that, we will provide an update on our next meeting's presenters and then final comments in preparation to closing. And I would like to just briefly uh, ask any of our officers or members of Rubicon to not be so shy this evening if you have questions and comments. So hopefully we can pull at least one good final comment out of someone. If not, well, when Lodge opens soon, we might have to, uh, we might have to restructure. <laughs> That's Masonic humor. Brothers and friends, the purpose of these meetings is very simple. The purpose is to bring together Masons of all degrees and men who are interested in Freemasonry in a professional online format that provides thoughtful education, deep discussion, live question and answer, fraternal reflection, and conviviality within the hearts of everyone in our global fraternity. The protocol for these meetings are very simple and as follows. These are not tiled meetings. These are virtual education meetings. They're not a substitute for lodge or regular stated Masonic communications. Masons of all degrees anywhere are welcome to attend so long as the lodge that they are from is recognized by the Grand Lodge of Kentucky. Men who are not Freemasons may also attend as long as they are referred by or vouched for by a fellow Mason who is also a member in good standing of a lodge that is recognized by the Grand Lodge of Kentucky. Please be mindful that anything discussed these evenings should be suitable for Masons of all degrees as well as non-Masons. Gentlemanly manners are to be expected without question during these online meetings. No alcohol, no smoking, no food, no foul language will be permitted, and attendees may be removed if not following these protocols. There will be no discussion of politics or religion at any time. 
There will be live question and answer discussion period following the presentation, during which all are encouraged to participate. If you think of a question during the education presentation, please type your question in the chat bar. If you would like to ask your question verbally, then we can do that as well. Simply say that I would like to ask a question verbally, and if time permits, you will be called upon. Brothers, here are some recommendations that should hopefully help ensure that this virtual meeting is enjoyable for all attendees. First, please be sure to type your full name and the lodge you are from under your picture or video to identify yourself to all others that are on this meeting. Technology, as we have witnessed many times, is sometimes challenging, so please be patient should any technical difficulties occur. Please also enable your video camera so other attendees can see you. Please reduce any background noise and keep your microphone muted when not speaking. And finally, please turn off all other computer programs and try to eliminate all outside distractions in your environment. Brothers and friends, Worship Brother Bizak will now introduce the guest speaker of, our e of this evening, which is Wor Worshipful Brother Christopher Murphy. Thank you, Worshipful Master. Good evening, brothers. Christopher Murphy is the sitting master at Bandoneerum Lodge and past master and charter member and current secretary of Fibonacci Lodge 112, both under the most worshipful Grand Lodge and free accepted Masons of Vermont. He's the editor and contributing author of Exploring Grand Lodge Freemasonry, and I'd like to hold this up in case you have not seen this book or have an interest in uh, acquiring it. I'm sure Chris can help you with uh, directing you to the publisher, but it's an excellent book and he's a contributing author in this volume. This was released by Plumstone in 2017. He's also a frequent contributor to the Philalethes Journal and is also published in the Plum Line, Southern California Lodge of Research Fraternal Review and Living Stones Masonic Magazine. And he was one of the speakers at the 10th Annual Symposium of the Masonic Restoration Foundation here in Lexington last year. Worshipful Brother Murphy is, uh, has a particular interest and expertise in the genuine Masonic spirit and praxis of the early Grand Lodge era that is evidenced in the surviving literature. He lives in Vermont with his wife and two children. Worshipful Brother Chris, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Brother John, and thank you also to Worshipful Brother Evans. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to, and an honor to be able to participate in tonight's ed education uh, uh, presentation. Um, this series that you are offering to Freemasons worldwide is really invaluable. Uh, you know, it's been interesting to see how uh, different lodges, different grand lodges, and different uh, individual Masons have responded to the pandemic and, and the shift in how we need to do things for the time being. And uh, the work of, of Lexington Lodge and the Rubicon Masonic Society has just been exemplary. So thank you so much for that. Um, and, brother, and, if I could interrupt real, real quick, I apologize, brother. Your audio on my end is, is a little bit quiet. And, okay. I'm, and I'm, so I'm not sure if that's something that you possibly could control on your end. But I thought we'd go ahead and address that. Let me tell me, is that any better? That is much better. Thank you, brother. Okay, very good. Very good. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, you know, and brethren, I just, I, I did want to say one other thing uh, because it would feel like it would be remiss of me if I didn't uh, at least acknowledge it, um, that some terrible things are happening uh, across our nation tonight and, and for the last few nights. And uh, hearing the words of Brother Newton in that prayer, uh, or in, in the poem, rather, uh, at our opening, um, I, I think it's particularly important now. Uh, that the virtue and the harmony and the love espoused by the craft, uh, I think the world probably needs that more than ever right now. So, um, yes, just something to keep in mind. <clears throat> so, uh, brethren, uh, what I wanted, to, what we will be doing tonight uh, is talking about and really deconstructing uh, a, a mode of thought that has sort of seeped in to contemporary Freemasonry. Um, this, this line of thought sort of goes like this. Uh, it tells us that really... There's nothing uh, special or important in Freemasonry. There's no real deep philosophy, certainly no kind of spirituality. Um, this, this line of thought says it's really just a social gathering and we should keep it at that. Um, this line of thought goes so far as to say that um, 
really the only secrets are those modes of recognition, right? Grips and handshakes and things like that. Uh, or even worse, sometimes they go so far as to say the only secret is there are no secrets, right? And, and I'm sure many of us have heard those or maybe even said those things uh, ourselves. But really, with all brotherly love and respect, it needs to be said that that approach to our craft is not correct, all right? Now, uh, you, you will often hear that point of view justified with sort of an open-ended, uh, well, they used to meet in taverns, right? As if nothing else needs to be said on the matter. Uh, the implication is, of course, that because Masons met in taverns, then their, their organization must have been built around frivolity, right? But meeting in taverns no more made early Masons drunkards than meeting in gardens would have made them florists or vegetarians, right? Because it is not the setting that determines the work, right? It is the self-concept. It is the intent of the work. So because of this, because of the rationale for this misperception, the whole they used to meet in taverns, uh, I have called this fallacy the tavern myth. But rather than being heard as a challenge for where early Masonic assemblies met, because they certainly did meet in taverns. Uh, taverns were the civic and social centers of many European and colonial cities and villages. And it makes perfect sense that Masons would have met in these establishments. So don't, so don't hear it as, as me disputing where they met. Instead, hear that phrase, tavern myth, to describe the overarching theme of minimization and a denial of what Masons did when in lodge assembled. All right. It denies the deeply personal and deeply spiritual and philosophical work that these men actually did. And because the, the brother who espouses the tavern myth, because he turns to where these early Masons met as justification for that mindset, we are going to look at the words, the surviving literature of those early Masons themselves to get an understanding of what early Freemasonry was all about. Because certainly, if the tavern myth is true, we will see that mindset, that point of view, reflected in the surviving writings of these early brethren. All right? And if we find something else in the surviving writing of these early brethren, then we'll know something else about the tavern myth. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen right now. And I just want to acknowledge. Can we see this, everyone? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the thumbs up, Brother Brad. Here we go. I also want to acknowledge before we kick off, not to be too hard on ourselves. If any of us have sort of said this or espoused this point of view before, don't be too hard on ourselves because this idea of the tavern myth, as you will see as soon as my computer screen uh, responds, there it is. This idea of the tavern myth is not new. For instance, this idea uh, prompted our brother James Galloway in 1768 to write, Besides, our meeting at the houses of publicians gives us the air of a bacchanalian society instead of that appearance of gravity and wisdom which our order justly requires, right? And this, this letter, incidentally, sorry, this writing came from a letter in which Brother Galloway was talking about fundraising ideas for how the Grand Lodge building in London could be built. Right? Because the idea was they needed to get out of the taverns because it was off, it was providing a misperception and confusion for those people about what Freemasonry was really about. So the way we're going to unpack this, brethren, is we're going to look at two things. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the praxis of these early lodges, right? What, what Freemasonry looked like in the early Grand Lodge era, right? What they were doing. Um, we're then going to follow that up with, a, with the far meatier and to me far more interesting idea of why they did what they did. What did they believe about the craft and about themselves that prompted them to act in the way that they did? All right, that's the pistis, right? That's the, what they, that's the why they did, the praxis of what they did. All right, <clears throat> so for starters, the idea of the tavern myth says that because these lodges met uh, for frivolity and, and, and merely socializing, that there is therefore nothing serious or solemn or important that was happening in the lodges. Okay, if that's true, we should see it referenced in the writings of the time. This is the, the cover page for the Constitution of the Freemasons. Uh, it was authored in 1723 by Brother James Anderson. And this was the response by the brand new Grand Lodge of England uh, to a far older Masonic tradition. Uh, the, the tradition, the custom had it, that you know, starting around the end of the 1300s is when we have our earliest example. 
of these independent operative slash speculative lodges would keep a book of constitutions. And the book of constitutions uh, generally had two parts then. Uh, it was a telling of the traditional history, like their central legends, which we're gonna spend a lot of time on tonight. But it also had a list of rules, like how, how Masons ought to conduct themselves. So uh, we should know the story. Uh, in 1716, four of these London lodges that acted in this independent way said, hey, we should form a Grand Lodge. So let's all come back next year to this spot. We'll have a big feast and we'll kick off our new Grand Lodge. And in 1717, they did just that. And a few years later, as I said, the rulers of the craft said, you know what? We need one of those books of constitutions. So they brought along James Anderson to compile such a book. And again, it had the traditional history and it had a list of charges. When Brother Anderson goes on to tell us about what it looks like in Lodge, he writes this. You are not to hold private committees or separate conversation without leave from the master, nor to talk of anything impertinent or unseemly, nor interrupt the master or wardens or any brother speaking to the master, nor behave yourself ludicrously or jestingly while the Lodge is engaged in what is serious and solemn, nor use any unbecoming language upon any pretense whatsoever, but to pay due reverence to your master, wardens, and fellows, and to put them to worship. Now, the tavern myth, as I said, paints the idea of these lodges as these sort of, you know, raucous get-togethers of, of guys who are just, you know, bending their elbows. But here, we have a clear indication that not only should, you know, chit-chatting and jokes and idleness, that not only should that not be in the lodge room, but in fact, there's this admonition that the lodge engages in serious and solemn work, right? Which is absolutely against what the tavern myth would tell us. Now, this, this charge not only set the tone for all lodge workings moving forward, but it also captures what was already occurring in these lodges in the early Grand Lodge era, all right? Brother Anderson was not breaking new ground with this. He was simply setting onto paper what was already existing in these lodges. And yet, as a mark of the importance of his words, we find Anderson's constitutions uh, reprinted throughout English-speaking Freemasonry. So again, 1723 is when we have his constitutions. In 1730, we find Brother John Pennell, the Grand Secretary for the Grand Lodge of Ireland, um, producing his book of constitutions, which essentially was a reprint of Anderson's book. A little bit of original material, but not a whole lot of that. So that's 1730. In 1734, we have Brother Benjamin Franklin reprinting Anderson's 1723 constitutions for the use of the Brethren in North America. 1738 rolls around and Brother Anderson publishes his second edition of constitutions, which was subsequently adopted by the Grand Lodge of Ireland. And in 1740, Brother William Smith, right, uh, I'm sorry, in 1740, the Grand Lodge of Scotland adopts Brother William Smith's pocket companion for Freemasons, which also had copied the charges from Anderson. And so in 17 years, we have the, the Masonic experience of those in England, Ireland, Scotland, and the colonies of North America, all adhering to this charge regarding proper conduct when in Lodge assembled. All right, and again, there may still have been brethren or entire lodges of brethren who disregarded these charges, but it's important to understand that those men were doing so in defiance of what their Grand Lodge set out that they ought to be doing. Right, so therefore, any brother today choosing to emulate their example is choosing to emulate that defiant mason and really chops against the harmony of our institution. So that was about what it looked like in Lodge. And now we need to combat this idea within the tavern myth that these guys were just getting together to drink. All right, and again, if that's what these guys were there for, then we should see that reflected in the writing. Well, here's what the early masons had to say about drunkenness. <clears throat> brother James Huey writing to us from Ireland. And I will just take an aside. My last name is Murphy, so I feel a point of privilege in acknowledging the reputation of the Irish when it comes to drinking a certain amount, right? But here we have Brother James Huey, an Irish Mason, writing to us in 1768, telling us that it is an established law in every lodge that no Mason shall exceed a certain quantity of liquor, which is likewise fixed at a standard much within the bounds of moderation. The pleasures of the flowing bowl are the most inconsiderable gratifications indulged in by the Society of Masons, whose refined tastes direct them to nobler enjoyments, the social repast of the soul, the contemplation of wisdom, and the animating precepts of virtue. 
going a step further, uh, our brother uh, William Hutchins, writing in the 1770s, outlined those virtues that ought to mark a Freemason. He tells us charity, benevolence, justice, temperance, chastity, and brotherly love are those things that should mark a Freemason. And then he offers the antithesis, the anti-virtues for Masons. And of those, he notes darkness, obscenity, drunkenness, hatred, and malice. And this, to me, was very striking in how it framed drunkenness. Look at the company that drunkenness keeps in this list. Darkness, hatred, malice. These are heavy, heavy words that Masons ought to avoid. And right in the middle of them is drunkenness. Which, again, if the tavern myth were to hold true, we would not see this in there. We wouldn't see it at all. But instead, we have this admonition to not to, you're not a teetotaler, but certainly to be temperate in your, in your use of alcohol. And finally, just as there was a charge regarding conduct in Lodge, there was a charge regarding conduct after Lodge, in which Brother Anderson and all those other Grand Lodges that copied his words, we are told, you may enjoy yourself with innocent mirth, treating one another according to ability, but avoiding all excess, or forcing any brother to eat or drink beyond his inclination, or hindering him from going when his occasion calls him, or doing or saying anything offensive, or that may forbid an easy and free conversation, for that would blast our harmony and defeat our laudable purposes. So again, you can drink, you can eat, you can be merry, but we're not there to do that in excess. That's not what this was about. Now, the final bit about the praxis, about what this looked like, has to do with what we know to be the separation between labor and refreshment. Now, again, the tavern myth holds that there was no time of, of serious work, right? There was no time when these guys weren't refreshing themselves. So therefore, we see in the, in the, the concept of the tavern myth sort of a, an interweaving, an enmeshment of labor and refreshment. When we know and the early Masonic writing tells us that these constituted two distinct phases of the Masonic experiences. Um, we're going to be referencing Masonic songs a lot tonight. And among those Masonic songs, uh, the oldest surviving song is this. It's called the Entered Apprentices Song. Uh, it was credited to a brother, Matthew Burkhead, who ended up being a master of, one of Lodge Number no. 5 in London. Uh, and it was reprinted a bunch of times. And when it was printed in Anderson's Constitutions, it came with this instruction to be sung when all grave business is over and with the master's leave. All right, so this, along with Anderson's charge about um, behavior after Lodge, serve as the two oldest printed examples of this separation between labor and refreshment. Now, this separation was captured in the public sphere a few years later. Uh, the June 26th edition of the Dublin Weekly Journal in 1725 had an article about a procession by the Grand Lodge of Ireland in its constituent lodges. And it talked about men being dressed in their finery and they looked very dignified. And then they went in and had the secret meeting. And then they came out and had this huge feast. They talk about 120 dishes of meat and porter and wine and musicians and this grand gala. But the article itself points out that all of that celebrating happened after performing the mystical ceremonies of the Grand Lodge, which are held so sacred that they must not be discovered. All right, didn't say they happened during the mystical ceremonies or that the partying happened concurrent to the mystical ceremonies. No, it tells us there was a separation between this labor and refreshment. One final example of this, our brother Thomas Dunkerley beautifully sums up this separation with this passage when he addressed the craft in 1769. To subdue the passions and improve in useful scientific knowledge, to instruct younger brethren and initiate the unenlightened are the principal duties of the lodge, which when done and the word of God is closed, we indulge with a song and cheerful glass, still answering the same decency and regularity with strict attention to the golden mean. Now, uh, I don't know how many men who are watching tonight are not Freemasons, uh, but for all the Masons who are, who are watching, uh, the imagery of this should be clear, right? Which when done and the word of God is closed, that indicates what is happening. It indicates what the separation is in this paragraph by Brother John Curley. So <clears throat> hopefully that was quick. Uh, I acknowledge that is probably the driest part of this presentation because here the pistis, the why, the what these guys believed, this is the heart of it. And this explains why there were those expectations of decorum, why were those expectations of temperance, why there was this importance of separating 
labor from refreshment, it all comes down to how early Freemasons viewed themselves and how they viewed their early Freemasonry. This is the meat of it, and this gets to the heart not only of what Freemasonry was, but I believe what traditional observance Freemasonry strives to restore to lodges today. So <clears throat> let's get into this. Again, the tavern myth says that there was nothing really important happening in these lodges. Uh, it was just a time to sort of relax, kick back their heels, maybe get away from the family for a bit. Okay, if that's true, and if there was nothing important happening in those lodges and nothing of importance to the craft, then we ought to see that reflected in the way that early Masons wrote about their Freemasonry. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the ways that these Masons describe themselves and their fraternity. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, divine science, craft divine, the sublime science of Masonry, sacred order, sacred privilege, sacred brotherhood, mystery divine, mystical rites, perfection of the art of masonry, the royal science, hail, glorious craft, distinguished science, hail, art divine, sacred art by heaven designed, daughter of heaven, heavenly genius, the children of light. This is not the way you describe fish fries and shotgun raffles. This is not the way that men describe an order that is merely for frivolity or entertainment. This shows men deeply dedicated to something they find sacred, divine, important, and therefore cuts away at this idea of the tavern myth. And I'll go you one step further. Not only did this generally describe how men viewed their Freemasonry, the early Freemasons had a term for guys who went through the ceremonies of the craft, but denied this importance, denied the philosophical and spiritual importance. That term was false brother. And the early Masons did not write kindly about the false brethren. For instance, Brother Edward Oakley, writing in 1728, said, It is generally to be observed that of these are the false brethren who fail in their duty and obedience by their ignorance and being strangers to the intent and constitutions of the sciences. All right, they fail in their duty and obedience. They fail in their praxis and their pistis. They fail in what and why. That is the false brother. Brother Fifel de Signy, writing to us from Ireland, puts the onus for these false brethren at the feet of lodges who are not guarding well their west gate. He writes, several lodges, too many have been fond of a trifling treat and have sold their birthrights at a mean price, even for a mess of pottage. And instead of taking a due and a special care to inquire into the reputation of character of the candidate, they have often imprudently hurried him into the craft. Brother William Smith, writing in 1736, takes a decidedly biblical look at these men. Those wicked masons shall receive punishment instead of reward for spoiling the work of the grand architect by introducing confusion instead of order and blending the two opposites of light and darkness together. These erect vain fabrics according to their own depraved imaginations, supporting them by ignorance, debility, and deformity, which when the trumpets blow come down with mighty ruin on the builders' heads. Let the names of those be erased out of the book end, and their devices scattered as dust before the wind. Again, this is the way men describe something of significant importance to themselves. Okay, moving on. So we have Freemasonry is important. Okay, but what is it about? <clears throat> the idea behind the tavern myth tells us that secrets, the secrets of Masonry, are just modes of recognition, right? If you know those modes of recognition, goes the tavern myth, you know the secrets of Masonry. Again, if that's true, we'll see that reflected in the writing. Now, um, I'm going to make reference to a few different what are known as exposures. An exposure was this. An exposure was when a man went through the ceremonies of masonry, then ran home, wrote them all out, printed it, and published it for the profane world. Right? Those ritual exposures um, really help us chart the development of ritual over time. And one of the most, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Um, the, probably the most infamous, infamous exposure for North American Masons is that published by William Morgan, right? Uh, that prompted the whole Morgan affair. 
But before Morgan came around, there was a guy named Sam Pritchard, who in 1730 printed an exposure called Masonry Dissected. And Masonry Dissected has the distinction of being the first exposure to cover all three degrees, uh, including uh, descriptions of grips and disclosure of passwords. So the Tavern Myth says that anyone who has read Masonry Dissected by Sam Pritchard would know all the secrets of Freemasonry. But that's not what the Masons tell us. The Masons tell us, for instance, like this, yet the secret remains untouched and the traitors have only exposed themselves in those attempts. And let the world see in short that they have not been able to come at the secrets itself and really know nothing of the matter. Going a step further, in response to, to exposures in general, a brother writing as Brother Euclid in 1738 tells us for all of them put together, all of those exposures, don't discover the profound and sublime things of old masonry, nor can any man not a mason make use of those incoherent smatterings interspersed with ignorant nonsense and gross falsities among bright brothers for any other purpose but to be laughed at. This, this whole idea was summed up very nicely in a song from 1734. Of that happy secret when we are possessed, our tongues can't explain what is lodged in our breast. For the blessing so great, it can ne'er be expressed. And this puts the point on it. It doesn't matter how eloquent a speaker I might be. It doesn't matter how much you read. It doesn't matter. I may know the full vocabulary of every spoken language on the earth, and the muses may move through me in giving me the poetry and, and eloquence of a saint. I would still not be able to disclose to you Masonic secrets, because Masonic secrets are ineffable by nature. They have that, that, that air of, of, ineff of ineffability, I think that's a word, that air, they, they must be experienced. You can't express a secret, you can't explain Masonic secrecy because it has to be experienced. That's what is secret about Freemasonry. We see that phrase this way in 1734. Incidentally, this 1734 oration that I'm drawing this from is the, not only the oldest American Masonic oration, it is the oldest surviving private Masonic oration. And it tells us that the essential secrets of Masonry indeed are everlastingly safe and can never be revealed abroad because they can never be understood by such as are unenlightened. If you've not been through the Masonic process, you will not understand the Masonic secrets. One final example again from Brother DeSigny uh, with the, the poetry of the Irish. And I would not have the world imagine that they can ever arrive at the perfection of the art of masonry without first undergoing a certain operation, which will entirely remove that film that at present hangs over their visionary orb. For although they may be of the opinion that they already see very well, I just venture to say that they are as much in darkness at this time as an unfortunate prisoner who is confined in such a dungeon that the least glimmering ray of light cannot possibly creep into him. Okay. So, Masonry is important, Freemasonry is experiential, but where does Freemasonry come from? Now, I just, uh, as a bit of a disclaimer, from this point moving forward, um, the writing takes on a, a very almost religious feel to it in terms of the writing. And in fact, there is, there is much uh, explicitly Judeo-Christian content within what we're about to talk about. It is essential to remember that Freemasonry is distinguished by its adherence to religious universality. All right, again, the poem that was uh, Brother, Brother Newton's poem at the beginning uh, said it beautifully. Freemasons only require a belief in the divine. It does not matter the name or the face an individual brother ascribes to God, merely that there is a belief in God. And so that brethren of every faith can still meet together in harmony and love. That's the idea behind Masonic religious universality. It may therefore be curious that we're going to find explicitly Judeo-Christian language in what is meant to be a, a religiously universal set of, set of writings. It's important here to understand the cultural context of the time and place in which Freemasonry came into full bloom. Right? We're talking about the British Isles in the 1600s and 1700s. Right? This is an overwhelmingly Christian place with a, with a Christian tradition dating back hundreds and hundreds of years it is going to be very difficult to strip away that cultural context when these men were describing and talking about God and religion, all right? But instead of hearing these references to Christianity as, an endor as a Masonic endorsement of Christianity, 
Just know it, it, it's a cultural context sort of thing. And we should hear that Freemasonry is not Christian. Or more, more precisely, Freemasonry is not only Christian. Okay, so sort of with that understanding, <clears throat> we talk about where Freemasonry came from. Um, there was a legend that exists within the craft known as the traditional history. And it is the mystic, mythic telling of where the craft came from. It, Brother Anderson wrote about it in 1723, but it was an inherent component of 300 years worth of private manuscripts written before then. All right, so when Brother Anderson put pen to paper to write this traditional history, he was merely, he was just the latest in a long line of centuries worth of these stories being told. And it begins with these words. Adam, our first parent, created after the image of God, the great architect of the universe, must have had the liberal sciences, particularly geometry, written on his heart. And there it begins, with the sacred, secret knowledge of masonry, deemed so essential by God to the happiness and welfare of mankind that the great architect centers it, in the, it nests it in the center of the very first man. Now, Adam has the ark. He goes on to teach all three of his sons. He teaches Cain and Abel. Cain slays Abel, and then Cain takes off, leaving Seth, living with Adam and being the beneficiary of that secret Masonic knowledge. Seth then teaches his lineage, including godly Enoch, Enoch, before he was transposed still alive to heaven, inscribed these secrets on two pillars. You see, Enoch knew that God was angry and that God was wrathful and that God was going to wipe out the earth. So Enoch erected two pillars, one, to made, made, one made to withstand flame, another made to withstand flood, so that regardless of the form of the great architect's wrath, the, the secrets would be preserved. In other words, and maybe this uh, language sounds familiar in your grand jurisdiction, Enoch was the first to erect an archive to masonry to survive conflagration and inundation. Following that, of course, Noah learns these. Noah is commanded by the great architect to build a floating lodge, which, as the story goes, though made of wood, was certainly crafted according to the rules of geometry and masonry. Noah teaches his sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. They get aboard the ark and they carry over the flood the arts and traditions of the antediluvians. After that, they land, they disperse. 100 years later, they get together for the building of the Tower of Babel. There are some right masons, there are some Cowans, and God confuses the tongues and they go on their way, but it hinders not the improvement of masonry. To the point that these guys, Hiram Abiff and King Solomon, can manifest that art to the building of the Temple of Jerusalem. From there, we have the likes of Brother Pythagoras, Brother Euclid, the Egyptian pharaohs, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, eventually unto the kings of Europe and to the grand masters of today. Other tellings include Brother Hermes Trismegistus, Brother Zoroaster, and even the very angels of heaven themselves all practicing the royal art, thereby creating an unbroken line from God to Adam through that lineage into the lodges today. All of which is to say that from its inception, Freemasonry was viewed as a mystic brotherhood. All right, protectors of this holy secret that has survived through the ages. And, and, and it is essential for us to understand just how pervasive this legend was in craft consciousness, right? You, are, you would be very hard pressed to find any example of early Masonic writing, be that ritual, be that books of constitutions, poems, songs, exegeses, speeches, orations that don't in some way make reference to this myth be it to Adam or be it to Noah or King Solomon, uh, Pythagoras, we find this myth nearly everywhere in the first 100 years, 150 years of early Masonic writing, right? It was everywhere. And it tells us that Freemasonry was given to mankind by the great architects. And, and it even shows up in ritual. Uh, the Grand Manuscript from 1724 asks the question, why is it called Freemasonry? The answer, first, because a free gift of God to the children of men. Second, free from the interruption of infernal spirits. Thirdly, a free union among the brothers of that holy secret to remain forever. All right, so let's look at this. Church. First, a free gift of God to men. We covered that. Moreover, it keeps its votaries free from evil. All right, it interrupts those infernal spirits. So much so that the brethren who practice it are said to be keepers of that holy secret. 
Okay, so Freemasonry is important. Freemasonry is experiential. Freemasonry is divinely sourced, but why? What's the purpose of Freemasonry? As the early Freemasons themselves tell us, the purpose of Masonry is to come to an understanding of the divine. And we find this in their surviving writings. Brother Robert Samber, writing in 1722, and this, uh, by the way, is the earliest sort of uh, analysis, uh, um, uh, interpretation we have of the craft. 1722 writes, But alas, my brethren, what are we in our little globe below to that stupendous celestial masonry above, where the almighty architect has stretched out the heavens as a curtain, which he has richly embroidered with the stars and with his immortal compasses, as from a punctum, circumscribed the mighty all is himself the center of all things, yet knows no circumference. So eagle-eyed brethren out there are going to see this as the first uh, reference we have to that point within a circle, which should be in every good lodge. Uh, and and setting, even setting aside the, the obviously hermetic overtones of this, like the above and the below, the mighty all, we have this statement that God has rendered creation via masonry, celestial masonry in Samber's words. And as we practice masonry here in our little globe below, what we are trying to do is come to an imperfect yet glorious approximation of that celestial masonry above. We are trying to come to an understanding of the divine through our practice of our craft here on earth. And this continues. But the William Smith, uh, who was again that author of the, of the Book of Constitutions of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, writes that the principles of geometry were eternally in the mind of the great Elohim, ere yet the heavens were displayed where the earth formed. And when that happy distinction in his will arose, when nature should flow out from ideal into real existence, then was the whole creation rang out in sweet geometric order before its great original, and approved and blessed by him. And by this divine science only are we enabled to trace out the wondrous works of the deity and give reasonable solutions to the various phenomena of nature. So again, geometry is the means by which the great architect man made the world and creation manifest. Right? It's the principles of geometry eternally in his mind, the sweet geometric order that rang out creation. And we are told, it, we are told it is the divine science, and it is only through an understanding of that divine science that we can understand the created world of God. So again, we need to understand as, we're, as we move through this early Masonic writing, geometry, masonry, uh, art, craft, science, these, are, these words are used almost interchangeably. Brother John Henley gives us one more example. Brother John Henley was the first chaplain of the Grand Lodge and writes, God, our all-wise master, having disposed the fabric of the universe in number, weight, and measure, having laid the foundation of the earth, stretched the line upon it, and hung it, in Job's phrase, upon nothing but its mysterious geometry. So again, using the sciences we have at our disposal here on earth, through the, through the lens of Freemasonry, coming to an understanding of the divine. But moreover, we have, this, we have a, a, a belief given to us through early Masonic prayer. So again, this comes from 1730. This is the Book of Constitutions for the Grand Lodge of Ireland. And among the, the few bits of original content that Brother Pinnell added was this prayer. This is part of the oldest surviving written Masonic prayer. And it goes like this. This section goes like this. And we beseech thee, O Lord God, to bless this our present undertaking, and grant that this our new brother may dedicate his life to thy service and be a true and faithful brother among us. And do him with divine wisdom, that he may, with the secrets of masonry, be able to unfold the mysteries of godliness in Christianity. Now pay attention to what this says. This says, in order to unfold the mysteries of godliness, to know God, to come to a gnosis of the Almighty, a person needs two things. The divine, uh, the, the permission of the divine, that, that, that divine approbation, but also a framework, a framework in the form of the secrets of masonry. Imagine the pious audacity of a statement like this. You know, anybody can go to church to learn to worship. But if you want to know God, 
you need to come to Lodge because it's through Lodge, it's through Freemasonry that enables a man to have the framework and to make sense of that divine spark, to make sense of that light that none but craftsmen ever saw. That's what this prayer is telling us. It takes Masonry to know God. And if this seems wild, uh, I'm going to tell you, we say this prayer too. It's slightly more muted when we say it, but we say this prayer too. Let me take you through a little bit of the way that it's changed. In 1769, uh, Brother Isaac Head, who was the provincial grand master of the Sicily Isles, changed that last bit to read, with the attainment of the knowledge of the arcana of masonry may be also revealed the sacred and sublime principles of godliness and Christianity. And Brother William Preston, who truly is the, he and uh, Brother Webb uh, are really the fathers of the ritual that we use across North America. But William Preston, writing in 1772, provided the more muted form by saying, by the secrets of this art, he may be better enabled to unfold the mysteries of godliness to the honor of thy holy name. And for any of you, any of you who know Brother Bob Davis, uh, in his book, The Mason's Words, he points out that a version of this prayer is given almost universally across North America at the making of a Mason. All right, so it may sound wild, but we're still preaching the same lesson today. One final word on this, telling us that the secret of Freemasonry was the very basis of religion and so greatly conducing to the welfare of mankind as to be even essential to the salvation of their souls. By this point, it's, it's almost a, a too often repeated a joke, but I'll say it anyway. The tavern myth doesn't stand up to this, right? If we're looking at the tavern myth and this idea that guys got together just to have a good time, that story cannot hold up against the weight of this writing. But we're not done yet because we have the idea. Freemasonry was special. Freemasonry was experiential. Freemasonry was divinely sourced. The purpose of Freemasonry was to bring about a knowledge and understanding of God. And the final piece of this puzzle is how that is made manifest in Lodge Assembled. Now, because we are talking about knowing God and trying to reach that, perfective, that perfect divine state, the Lodge Room, as the source of that labor, takes on a paradisical form, all right, compared either to the paradise of Eden or to the paradise of heaven. For instance, writing in 1736, our brother William Smith tells us that our first father Adam was left without excuse when he transgressed the divine command. But after his default, the passions usurped the throne of reason. Now, there's a word in there that should jump out to anybody who's been through the entered apprentice degree. And in fact, if you ask an entered apprentice, I, I won't use the ritual because we're not in a tiled setting, but if you ask an entered apprentice why he is in lodge, he is going to give you an answer that has to do with one of those words. And that answer is actually pretty old. Um, one of the earliest examples of it is asked like this. What do you come here to do? Not to do my own proper will, but to subdue my passion still. So this idea of subduing my passions, when you look at that again through that quote above from William Smith, we find that duty to subdue our passions given to us in a highly religious context. We are told that the Freemason's chief duty of subduing his passions is a correction of original sin. And because it is that correction of original sin, it needs to be done in a setting that brings us into the, the, the likelihood and brings us into the similarity of that paradisical realm of Eden. 1736, we have a, a description of the initiation of a man into Freemasonry. And we are told that the world now from west to east, from south to north, affords nothing but objects of delight and surprise. Now the mystic gate of paradise is opened and the tree of life presents itself. And such as do not transgress the lodge's precepts, will be admitted to eat the immortal fruit thereof. Now, just to unpack this a little bit, this is talking about what happened in the early chapters of the book of Genesis. Right? The book of Genesis, in part, tells us how Adam and Eve fell from grace and were kicked out of Eden. And by being kicked out of Eden, they were denied access to the tree of life, which would have granted them immortality. Right? And after God kicked them out of Eden, he stationed a cherub with a flaming sword to guard that guard that doorway to Eden. In other words, uh, an angel uh, armed with the proper instrument of his office was charged to keep off all Cowans and eavesdroppers from entering back into Eden. And this imagery was used very purposely in describing the Tyler. 
right? There was one Masonic song that says, where cherubs guard the door with flaming swords before. And this is absolutely evoking that imagery of the angel with his flaming sword, keeping the unworthy out of Eden. And just one more example, a song from 1735 tells us that where sceptered reason from her throne surveys the lodge and makes us one, and harmony's delightful sway forever sheds ambrosial day, where we blessed Eden's pleasure taste, whilst balmy joys are our repast. So again, the work of the lodge is, is a sacred work. That's why the lodge room is like this paradise, and the overarching theme of this paradise is harmony. Everyone, every brother working together to achieve that perfection, or that, that to strive for perfection together. As I said, when it's not being compared to Eden, it's being compared to heaven, the other paradise. Another song, let's lead a good life whilst powers we have, and when that our bodies are laid in the grave, we hope with good conscience to heaven to climb and give Peter the password, the token, and sign. St. Peter, he opens, and so we pass in to a place that's prepared for all those free from sin, to that heavenly lodge, which is tiled most secure, a place that's prepared for all masons that's pure. And a few more quick examples, because I love this stuff so much. Brother Wells Calcott telling us in 1769, that we may reasonably hope to attain the celestial password and gain admittance into the lodge of our supreme grand master where pleasures flow for everyone. And one more for good measure. Let's look to ritual. What lodge are you of? The lodge of St. John. How does it stand? Perfect east and west as all temples do. And to put a finer point on it, how stands your lodge? East and west as kirks and chapels did of old. Why so? Because they were holy and so we ought. What we ought to do is holy, brethren. Now, one may ask, one may ask, why does any of this matter, right? Why does it matter to us in lodges today at all what Masons were doing and saying and thinking in their lodges 300 years ago? Well, brethren, the tavern myth tells us that there was nothing important to Freemasonry then. And even as speculative architects, we know that no edifice can stand upon a weak foundation. So therefore, the tavern myth tells us that there is nothing important to Freemasonry now. If there is nothing important to Freemasonry, then there is no reason at all for us to learn our lectures, for us to, to study and internalize uh, the virtues and the morality and the teachings of Freemasonry. If there's nothing important to Freemasonry now, there is no reason for new men to approach our portals and petition for the degrees. If there's nothing important to Freemasonry now, there's no reason for any of us to attempt to mentor these new candidates, to assume the role of office, or to perform ritual and lodges. And if there's nothing important to Freemasonry now, then what in the world are any of us doing here tonight? The tavern myth places a bushel over the light of our Freemasonry. And by dismissing and tearing down that tavern myth, we can allow our light to shine among men and among masons. So brethren, that's all I have for this evening. Thank you very much for your indulgence. And thank you very much again to the Brethren of Lexington Lodge number one for the opportunity. Thank you. First Brother Murphy, that was an excellent presentation. Excellent indeed. Um, thank you, brother. I've opened up the chat. So if anyone has questions, they can submit those to the chat and I'll, I'll read those to you and we can have uh, uh, as private as open discussion as you like with, with that individual. Um, I have a couple quick questions to kind of get the, the ball rolling a little bit. Please. Uh, I, I want to first ask you about the connection, the religious connection with Christianity to Freemasonry. My immediate thought process was putting myself in the mind of someone who would completely disagree with me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would, and I'm not of that side, but I'm curious to know your opinion. So the, the, the Catholic Church is adamantly, from every research I've done, against Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. So how would, how would you combat that? As someone... Well, who says that oh, I disagree, everything you're saying is humbug because, you know, what, what would you say to that? Sure. So I, I would say a few things. So, so looking to the Catholic Church as the final arbiter of Christianity is, is the wrong way to go about it. 
you know, there, there are, I don't know how many different sects of Christianity there are, but there's more than just Catholicism. And certainly, I mean, the, the papal bulls have been issued since 1738, I think, or so. Uh, and in fact, one of the quotes I took from Brother Designe, the one about uh, Freemasonry being required for the salvation of souls, was taken from his writing in response to that first papal bull. Um, so, so just because one part of Christianity says Freemasonry is a no-go doesn't mean that all aspects of Christianity say that Freemasonry is a no-go. Um, in terms of, is the craft Christian? No. Is the craft partially Christian? For sure. Um, I mean, again, we, we, find, we find the explicit term Christianity used many times in early Masonic writing. In the traditional history, we find Christ himself being in that sacred lineage, linking Adam to the, to the Freemasons of that day as a holder of that sacred art. Now, again, it's important to understand, Freemasonry ha always has, since the Grand Lodge era and up to today, embraced and insisted upon religious universality. But to say that Freemasonry is religiously universal does not mean it is irreligious. It is intensely religious. It is amazingly religious. And again, just I, your, your poem by Brother Newton at the beginning of this had so many beautiful bits that I'm, I'm really very, I'm so happy that you start these, these online communications with that poem. Because Brother Newton says, you know, a Freemason takes what is good from all of these world faiths and embraces the good in all of that for his own, not only for his own well-being, but for the well-being of everyone. And so you can be something other than Christian. You can be, you can simply have faith, right? Without any sort of dogma, without any sort of religion, without even knowing or thinking you know what God looks like or answers to. You can just have that sense and belief in the divine and still be a Freemason. You can be deeply Christian, you know, exclusively Christian and still be able to embrace Freemasonry. Um, so, free, so Christianity is a part of it. It's not all of it. And I, I think maybe I've lost track of your question, brother. <laughs> Worshipful oh, brother. That was, that was perfect. That was okay. Fantastic, okay. Uh, Very good. It kind of a piggybacking off of that. This presentation was obviously well thought out. You've given this, I would assume, a couple of times, um, probably. Versions of it, sure. Yeah. How do you incorporate this? attitude of Freemasonry in your individual lodge in Vermont? So uh, I am, I'm associated with two lodges in Vermont. Uh, as as uh, Worshipful Brother Bizek said, I'm the current Worshipful Master of Adoniram Lodge number 42. Uh, I've been with that lodge only a short time, uh, but I have the honor of sitting in the East there. And what we are trying at Adoniram is trying to restore uh, some of these older Masonic practices to the, to the lodge experience. Um, you know, Adoniram Lodge went the way that a lot of uh, a lot of lodges have across North America, in that it sort of lost the Freemasonry of Freemasonry, and so we we in, we put that back in. So it's it's everything from adopting um, simple procedures like a procession into lodge to music, um, to having a period. To, well, let me go back to having the business of the lodge, most of it taking place online so that we don't need to take the time we have in that tiled setting to deal with anything but the bare essential um, administrative work. And then we talk about masonry. Uh, the Worshipful Master, myself, will we'll give a talk about Freemasonry, some element of Freemasonry every communication. And during each communication, there's what I call an open lodge discussion, where ahead of time, I will let the brethren know what Masonic symbol, Masonic emblem, bit of usage that we'll be discussing, and it's the expectation that everyone comes to lodge prepared to share their own their own personal insight. Um, it's a work in progress. We're getting there, um, and then we will meet for the chain of union. We'll process out of the lodge, and we've restored the practice of harmony after after lodge, where we have masonic toasts and masonic song, and we have that time of fellowship together. So that's how we're re uh, restoring some of those practices at Adoniram. With Fibonacci Lodge, um, which is our traditional observance lodge in, in Vermont, uh, we had the benefit of having men, having Masons, who knew exactly what they wanted out of their Masonic experience coming together to form this lodge. And, and, and the Masonic experience we had that shared vision of was a restored, traditionally observant practice, where every, everything you can, every cool thing that happens in a TO lodge, Fibonacci does. But from, from our dedication to perfection in our ritual, 
to setting that tone and establishing that egregore of our lodge, um, to reestablishing a chamber of reflection, to uh, processions in, processions out, mu musical selections, um, quiet sort of contemplation times for that in lodge, open discussions about Freemasonry in lodge, and then a huge agape after every single communication. Again, with songs and toasts and the whole nine. Um, and, and both of those experiences with both of those lodge gives me different levels of satisfaction um, and, and remain the most satisfying Masonic experiences I have month after month after month. That's fantastic. Tell us about um, the Grand Lodge of Vermont, specifically with these times, not to taper away from your presentation, by any, mm -hmm. but to, to kind of uh, circle back to the times we're currently in. How is the Grand Lodge of Vermont handling your individual lodge, lodges, lodge business uh, recommendations during this time? Just curious. Yeah, so, um, so our uh, most worshipful Grand Master, Brother Stuart Corso, oh, probably six weeks ago or so now, uh, issued an edict saying lot of Masonic gatherings were not permitted to happen uh, in person. He encouraged all lodges to um, some online of brothers to meet, um, as well as encouraging lodge members to remember to reach out to those brethren who might not be able to access the internet or might not think to access the internet. Um, he empowered all lodges to um, take care of basic business without having to meet. So, you know, paying the bills, you know, paying, paying the electricity bill, that kind of thing. Um, put a, a stop to all ritual work, to all uh, investigations, to all um, affiliations. So all of that stopped. Most recently, we got the thumbs up to begin uh, meeting in Lodge again, but no more than 10 Masons at a time. Um, still with masks, with proper distancing to happen. Um, I think, well, definitely for Adoniram, again, a worshipful master, so I get to say this. Um, we're not going to be meeting at Adoniram for a while, um, in part because I don't want to have to say no to brother number 11 who tries to come through the door. Yeah. Right. If a brother is going to come out to lodge, I'm not going to tell him he can't come. So I'd rather we just continue to do our online meetings as we had. As for Fibonacci Lodge, I don't think we'll be meeting then either. I think we're going to wait until we are more able to safely come together together as an entire group. Sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, Worship Brother Bizak had uh, a good question that I'm going to ask him to ask you if that's all right. Um, of course. Worship Brother Bizak, would you mind to ask your question about... Uh, the waning of American Freemasonry, and any other questions that you had. Great presentation, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother John. The uh, early egregore of Masonry obviously has changed. And in your research, aside from uh, the changing generational values over the last 300 mm -hmm. years, stepping away from the historical intent of the fraternity in, in general, and waning from Anderson's constitution, what would you attribute from your research as to why the waning occurred over the decades as it has? Well, so this, this is not at all my area of expertise, taking a look at the, you know, my, my focus, and you were kind enough to call it an expertise. I don't know that I would go that far, but my focus is that first century of Freemasonry. So to look at this most recent century of Freemasonry is a bit outside my comfort zone. But I will tell you that I, I guess of, of most recently within that period is that we have created sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy for ourselves in that um, there came a time, and I don't fully understand why or how, but there came a time when lodges stopped requiring their candidates to do the memory work. There's a time when our lodges stopped mentoring the incoming candidates. There's a time when men who were uh, elected to sit in certain chairs were not held responsible and didn't hold themselves responsible for learning the duties and the ritual associated with those chairs. And once that happened, and once that sort of uh, you know, lack of commitment became accepted, then that just snows, snowballs into mediocrity and worse from there. And soon you have entire lodges of guys who don't know their ritual, who don't know their symbolism, who've never cracked their monitor, have certainly never read a Masonic book, and don't even know where to start. And as soon as you get a bunch of guys who constitute their lodge who don't even know where to start with Freemasonry, they start making up what Freemasonry should be. And so you get things like, oh, uh, oh, you're a good guy? That's what Masonry is all about. Or hey, we all went out bowling together. That's what Masonry is all about. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I don't mean to demean fellowship and brotherhood as being unimportant. They are essential to Freemasonry. But Freemasonry is a whole lot more than just hanging out together. But unfortunately, that's what came to pass for Freemasonry. Then you had even worse. You had these guys who were in Lodge who didn't know the first thing about their Freemasonry. And you would have these new guys come in who started to read stuff on the internet and had an idea about what Freemasonry could offer. And not only did they become totally disheartened by what they saw actually passing for Masonry in their lodges, but some of those young guys were met with hostility from these older guys who didn't like the fact that some young upstart had anything to say about what Freemasonry could be. And so those guys started to go away. Now, thankfully, now I count myself as sort of coming up in that part of Freemasonry, where I had a sense from reading certain things of what Freemasonry could offer. And although I didn't necessarily find that in my home lodge, I did find online communities, online communities of like-minded brethren, where I could stay engaged and talk about these deeper philosophical and religious elements behind Freemasonry that kept me satisfied until I was able to find the group of guys I did and we were able to charter this new lodge called Fibonacci. Um, you know, I recently, I recently heard a brother, an older experienced brother, um, call that, um, uh, that the raising of empty aprons. Pretty harsh, right? Um, but again, you know, we saw that back in the 1700s, they called them false brethren, right? These, I, th- these guys who went through masonry but would say that there was nothing really important to free, Freemasonry. So the false brethren back then got drummed out. The false brethren now still exist and still hold sway and are even grand masters of some grand jurisdictions. But I think it's becoming clear that the lodges that are most dynamic, who are growing the most, that have the youngest and most satisfied members are those lodges who are engaging in these restorative practices that I know Lexington Lodge is and I know Fibonacci and Adoniram Lodge are. Thank you, brother. I fully agree with you. Very good. Great minds. <laughs> uh, thank you, Worship Brother Bizak, and uh, excellent answer. Uh, piggybacking off of that, uh, we have a question from Worship Brother Dan Harenko, uh, who has spoken at Rubicon, I believe, once, maybe four or five years ago. Um, he asks, what strategies have you seen used to promote a rediscovery of these ancient truths to the Masons of today? Well, I think, I think more and more... Uh, Lodges and brethren are delving into the early Masonic writings. Um, truly, I mean, if we look at, at, a, at a period of time in which Freemasonry took off like wildfire, you can't beat the mid to late 1700s, right? Freemasonry exploded across the globe in those later decades of the 1700s. And so the way that men talked about their Freemasonry, believed about their Freemasonry, practiced their Freemasonry caused that excitement and caused the craft to spread in the way that it did. And so if we're looking for inspiration in Masonic writing, that's a place to go. I fully acknowledge uh, there might be an, uh, uh, an aspect of accessibility, not like, can you find these things? I mean, you go to Google books, you go to archive.org, you're going to find these old Masonic writings. That's not what I mean. I mean, a level of what I'll call intellectual accessibility. And I'm not talking about whether or not you're smart enough to understand it. I'm talking about whether or not um, that way of writing speaks to you. If reading the really old stuff doesn't grab you, then around the beginning of the 1900s, like around the time when Joseph Fort Newton was writing, when H.L. Uh, Haywood was writing, when uh, I'm forgetting a bunch of names now, but all these great Masonic thinkers of the early 20th century, like you go to those guys and you're going to find yourself inspired. Um, so I think there is a return to that kind of Masonic writing. I also think there is a return to the praxis that, we, that I talked about at the beginning of that presentation, that maybe guys and maybe lodges don't yet quite understand the why, but they're beginning to understand the what, the what of early Freemasonry, the what of what makes for an exciting, vibrant, successful, fulfilling lodge experience. They're beginning to understand what that looks like, and it's almost like a fake it till you make it sort of thing, mm-hmm. that you're doing these things, you're finding this fulfillment in there, and that, enc- that encourages you and inspires you to go out and seek those, those old teachings, those old ways of thinking. Um, and once you start falling down that rabbit hole, it is a wonderful rabbit hole to fall down because you find yourself just repeatedly being inspired and excited to go on and find the next thing in Freemasonry. 
That's a great answer. Essentially, it's it's proof. It's historical proof. Let's see what what the thought mindset was back then and uh, motivate you for today. It sounds like what what, what re resources would you recommend for someone on this presentation or listens to it to to find some of those older? Uh, yeah. So Google Google Books. Uh, you can find a ton of old stuff. Um, Archive.org. You can find a ton of books. old stuff. Are there any particular older books or writings top of your head? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, read Anderson's Constitutions, sure. 1723, and then the second edition from 1738. Mm -hmm. um, if you can, I mean, you can find it. So uh, I know that on Google Books, there is a series of books that were edited by George Oliver uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, called The Golden Remains of Masonic Writing. Uh, those are available in Google Books. And, and what Brother Oliver does is to sort of collect all of these old Masonic orations and speeches and bits of writing, um, specific ones. I, you know, not to, uh, well, I'll give a plug for the Phil Lathes, uh, the Phil Lathes Journal. If you are a recent subscriber or not yet a subscriber, when you do subscribe to the Phil Lathes Journal, you will be sent a DVD of all past issues of the Phil Lathes. And over the last 10 years or so, I know uh, um, Brother Sean Iyer has done a great job of really pull, uh, uh, analyzing some of these old Masonic orations. Um, so you can have access to those through a subscription to the Phil Lathes Journal. And how would one subscribe to that? Uh, go to freemasonry.com, I believe is the web, or .org rather, freemasonry.org. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, that's, a, really, I mean, maybe this is not a helpful answer, but read everything that was printed before 1790. Okay. You can do that and you'll be all set. All right. Just, just do that. Perfect. Just do that. Just read everything. We have a question from one of our past masters at Lexington Lodge number one, uh, Worship Brother Lyle Van Outer. Are there any practices such as prayer, meditation, contemplation that you specifically would recommend uh, that would work well with Freemasonry? I would recommend that uh, if, if you are interested in, in that sort of mindfulness that is brought from prayer and meditation, that, I mean, you can do one of a couple things. Um, what I have enjoyed doing is really analyzing and looking into Masonic prayer. You know, there are bunches of Masonic prayers that are out there. Yes. And I mean, we pray all the time in Lodge. We pray, we pray so often that we sort of kind of don't even see the profound beauty of some of these prayers, the profound teaching of some of these prayers. And in fact, for any of you who went to the MRF that your Lodge hosted, uh, you may have seen me talk about Masonic prayer. Um, but I have found that by, that by really sitting and contemplating these Masonic prayers, there are beauties that, are, that become unfolded that I never realized were there before. Beauties that talk about the relationship between the Freemason and the way that Freemason views God. Mm -hmm. um, so, for, so I am no expert in meditation. I'm no expert in anything. Uh, but from a Masonic perspective, I would say Masonic, studying Masonic prayer and really sitting with and contemplating Masonic prayer uh, is one avenue to, to, to pursue, for sure. Great answer. This is, uh, this is a good one. It's an easy one, I think, but this will be good to hear your answer. Can you explain egregore and agape for those that may not be familiar with those terms? Sure, and, uh, and I apologize for using terms if, if brethren weren't, weren't familiar with them. Uh, so egregore is this idea of sort of like the energy that gets charged up in a place, right? Um, you know, we all have our lodge rooms. We know what happens um, during a tiled lodge. We know the ritual that sort of sanctifies the space. We know the ritualistic movements that occur within this space. We have our, our, our devotions that are given to deity. We say these prayers. We have these invocational acts. And all of that, that, that you know, mystic religious process sort of builds up an energy charge. And that energy charge is known as the egregore of a place. I think that's kind of a, that's a, maybe too simple a way to put it, but that, that's, that's the general idea. Um, you know, for those of you who have been Masons a while, you, you know what I'm talking about. When you, when you get to lodge, right? It's been a week, it's been a couple of weeks. You have your tuxedo or your suit on and you get in the lodge and you just feel it. You just feel that something great is going to happen. You're experiencing that egregore. That's what you're experiencing. Um, in terms of agape, agape um, comes to us from uh, the Greek word for love. Uh, and it's a way to describe the harmony, the fellowship, the refreshment that happens after Lodge. So when I say that Fibonacci Lodge has a big agape after every communication, what we have is a big, uh, it's almost like a festive board. Uh, it's almost like a table lodge, although not really. 
uh, where we have ritualized toasting and singing and eating together. And that, that process is known as our agape. You, you do that after every meeting? Shady oh, yeah. Yeah, it's great. And how often do you meet? Once a month, twice a month? Once a month. Once a month. And how many brothers would attend that? Just curious. Uh, well, so we encourage every brother who attends the communication to also attend the agape. Um, because we really do see it as sort of two sides of the same coin, right? Mm -hmm. You need that, that fellowship. You need that, that festive release after so focused yeah. uh, a period of, of, of serious and solemn work. So they're really, they, they go hand in hand and they're both important to experience. Um, you know, and we have, we are, we're still a small lodge, but we are uh, very active within ourselves. So, you know, we have lodge meetings as small as, you know, seven master masons to maybe up to 20 when we count guests as well. So we still, we have small gatherings, um, but it, it's not the qual it's not the quantity at all that makes those worthwhile. Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Having the very serious, solemn uh, thought process and thinking of the meeting and then a little bit of lighthearted fellowship afterward. That's a, For sure. That's a good combination. Uh, let's see a couple more questions here. Lots of questions actually. We have one from one of the masters, past masters, uh, or a secretary of our lodge, Rick Varela, who's also current acting master of, of the lodge in Kentucky, Buford Lodge. He says, isn't masonry to be non-secular? So essentially, I think what he's trying to say in this question is, for those that might view your presentation as maybe too Christian and mm -hmm. not non-secular enough, what would your response be to those? So I totally get it. I totally get it. And I, if I were in a position to for either one of my lodges to write a toast or a charge or to write a prayer i would not use any language specific to any one religion uh because i totally agree if you know if i if if i invited a brother to give a prayer at at an iron lodge and he concluded that prayer by referencing any specific religion be it christianity or any other religion i would have an issue with that mm -hmm. um, because that really does cut against um, the universality at the heart of what we do. But there's a difference between our, between the cultural context now in the United States and the cultural context 300 years ago in the British Isles, right? You know, North America has become a very secular place, right? God does not, God and religion does not really play the role in the lives of the average person that it did 50 years ago, 100 years ago, certainly not what it played 300 years ago. Um, so the brother who asked that question, I totally get it. And I would be uncomfortable with that kind of language being used in lodge today, but it's what they did use then. And since we're, since I, I wanted to give sort of an unfiltered look at what these brethren were saying. Um, and so that, that's why I, that's why I didn't shy away from the use of that language, but I absolutely get your point, brother. You know, and there's also the other side of the coin. There has unfortunately and ironically been some members of our lodge that have demitted because we were too non-sectarian for them, it, rather than uh, being more Christian in our prayers and so forth. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's an interesting struggle in masonry that, that I've experienced and seen a lot of. Yeah. I'm sure you have to. Sure. Let's see here. Uh, be patient with me, sorry. Okay. Mr. Brad Murphy, do you think that in American masonry, we are reciprocating the tavern myth without even actually knowing the myth, meaning that we are misinterpreting what masonry is and only exaggerating what the community thinks of us? Uh, totally. And I think it, I think it gets back to um, what I was saying earlier about the idea of this self-fulfilling prophecy of lodges, you know, within the last few decades, not really doing a good job of educating the incoming guys, not holding themselves or each other to any sort of standard, and then that lack of standard becoming the norm to the point where we don't know what we are, right? How, I mean, I'm sure many of you are active on one online platform or another, um, and the question of what is Freemasonry comes up, and you get as many different answers as you have guys answering that threat, because we've really lost that sense of what we are and what we are here to do. Um, so yeah, we, I mean, the idea of the tavern myth, like they used to meet in taverns, that gets said all the time today. And in fact, that I had, I had a brother in my home lodge say that to me once, which, you know, got the ball rolling however many years ago I started thinking about this. Um, 
So, so yes, we, we absolutely, I say we as in Masons in general, not the guys who are here tonight watching this, but we as Masons in general perpetuate this idea of the tavern myth because we don't know any better. And so it's up to us to educate ourselves, which again, and I'm, I'm not just uh, uh, playing up to my hosts, which is why it's such a wonderful thing that Lexington Lodge has done what you've been doing uh, in hosting this series. Because uh, you know, lots of guys are finding when they don't have the ability to go to lodge, they're a lot more hungry for masonry than maybe they thought they were going to be. Yeah. And so they're seeking it out in online forums like this, which is why you're doing such a service for our craft. So thank you again. Well, thank you for, for helping out as well. Uh, we have another question that says, um, in your opinion, what can other brothers do outside of lodge to positively reinforce these Masonic behaviors? I mean, let's, let's practice what we preach, right? Like, uh, you know, we can't in a setting like this, but in private, we can talk about the esoteric elements of our craft, right? And, and I even brushed up against them tonight in this talk. Um, but there's an exoteric side to Freemasonry as well. There is that, that side that we're able to show. And, um, you know, we need to practice what we preach. We need to live. You know, when I, talk, when I said at the, the outset about virtue and harmony and love like those are the things that we need to bring to the table um you know if if we do view freemasonry as a holy secret if we do view freemasonry as the sacred lineage then we need to earn that day after day after day and it's not just earning it in terms of uh learning it like knowing our stuff so that we can act as stewards for the craft to pass it on to the next generation that's part of it but it's also acting it's being worthy of that holy secret it's that daily uh, effort to subdue our passions, right? And, and I doubt there's a single one of us who gets it right all the time. I know I certainly don't. There are moments probably every single day and maybe even entire days when I blow it completely. But the fact is we need to always be constantly striving for better in ourselves, to love more freely, to have patience, to have generosity of spirit as well as of goods. Like these are the things we can do to live our Freemasonry. And then when we're in Tiled Lodge together, we can talk about the deeper parts of it. Yeah. But in terms of that side of Masonry that we show the world, you know, be a good person. You know, where were you first prepared, right? Uh, I'm not gonna say the answer, but we know the answer. Where were you first prepared? We know that. And it's a constant daily preparation to be better and more worthy than the day before. Yeah, excellent response. and. I want to end with that, but I also want to give Worship Brother Rick Barella an opportunity to maybe discuss a little further what might be on his mind, because he's had some additional comments. So, uh, Worship Brother Barella, I'm going to unmute you, and I'd like for you to just maybe kind of make sure you get your thoughts out for our guests this evening. So, you should be unmuted. You might have to unmute yourself. I did. No, I was. Uh, his comments were very, very informative and very understanding. Uh, and I think I think he one of the points he made is that here in the U.S. we have become very secular in our religious beliefs and masonry, whereas my time overseas, I noticed that it wasn't that way. And I think he brought out some good points on 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 what we're trying to do, and how we need to progress forward in masonry. So that was it. I, I was you know just adding some things there. Okay. Yeah. Thank thank you, Worship Brother. Um. I just want to end this this presentation with you and, and segue to the next section by saying this was outstanding. Uh, we have had some phenomenal responses in the chat. So uh, thank you very much, brother. This is an excellent presentation. And I think I would go so far as to say that I certainly felt the egregore personally uh, on this, on this meeting. Uh, of course, not the same way uh, to, or to take away from anything that would happen or feel in Lodge, but there was an absolute energy. Uh, and you could feel it with your presentation, with your slides, with your passion for this topic. So it was fantastic. Uh, in fact, I would even go so far as to say that I think it was a beautiful presentation uh, because it really was, uh, it, you know, it, it gives you that feeling of, of belonging to this fraternity that is way more powerful than we are individually and collectively. So thank you. Well, thank you, brother. Thank you very much. All right, we are going to segue into the next section of our presentation, which is the preamble to the moment of reflection. Uh, Worship Brother Bizak, would you please begin with the preamble? 
Brothers, our education series is designed along the lines and somewhat similar to the structure of our stated meetings, but we all realize that stated meetings cannot be replicated in this particular format. That doesn't prevent us from devoting a few minutes of reflection as we do in our stated meetings and silently reflect on those things that we are grateful for, as well as those things that help remind us of our determination, not simply to be made members of this fraternity, but to become Freemasons. As we observe a moment of silence to do that, a brief solo instrument rendition of Escotian Farewell will play, music with which you may have heard or perhaps are familiar. The melody and lyrics are written in the style of a Scottish lament to capture the sense of sadness whenever camaraderie fellowship and community is interrupted. And of course, each of us can relate to that. And that is the egregore to which the worshipful master and worshipful brother Christopher was speaking of tonight. The song also reminds us of the longing that good men have to feel connected to other good men, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons we have met and we will continue to meet in this way for a while. So as we listen to this brief rendition, brothers, May you experience what is meant in our lectures about how music can not only soften the heart, but instill spirit. Brothers and friends, for those of you that may not have seen one of your pictures in that slide, um, it's probably because you haven't visited Lexington Lodge number one or come to one of our festive boards or events, so I encourage you to do so. If you have been to one of our festive boards or events and you did not see your picture, I probably couldn't uh, Photoshop you to look good enough to portray um, another bit of Masonic humor, which you have to have every now and then. Brothers and friends, next week's presentation will be on Monday, June 8th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our presenter for this evening is actually, and don't tell him I said this, however, I believe he is on this Zoom still, one of my favorite people in Freemasonry in the state of Kentucky. Worship Brother Dan Kimball is the past master of William O. Ware Lodge of Research in Kentucky. He is an outstanding uh, human being uh, with some phenomenal uh, knowledge in Freemasonry, and I'm excited to have him and question him and hear his presentation on the topic of who is left standing, Freemasonry after COVID-19. So I would encourage you all to absolutely attend this presentation. It will be, uh, again, one of the best ones we have. As a reminder, you do not need to RSVP again for this meeting. If you're on this meeting today, then you are already on our RSVP list. I will send out the meeting conference link and login information to your email twice prior to this meeting, once middle of the week and once the morning of. If you do not receive that or if you're not receiving those emails, please check your spam or junk folder because they have been sent. 
Please note that the meeting link next week and every subsequent meeting will always be different. If you try to use an old link, you will not be able to join that meeting. At this time, I would like to offer the floor to any non-shy officers of the Lexington Lodge Number 1 or any members of the Rubicon Masonic Society for any final comments. Please unmute yourself prior to speaking if you have any final comments. Worship Brother Bizak, I think we should absolutely remove that section from our presentations because it always falls on deaf ears. What do you yeah, I believe the uh, junior deacon's taking names already. <laughs> Very good. Uh, but the floor is yours, Worship Brother Bizak, for any final comments that you would like to make this evening. Brothers, it's always a pleasure to be in a company of good men. And I want to thank Worshipful Brother Chris Murphy for uh, his quick response to our request to be a part of this education series. Chris, it's always a pleasure to listen to you speak. You're passionate about your topic. And you always present something interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. And our thanks to Worshipful Brother Brian Evans for his work in putting together these series and the behind the scenes things he has done during this uh, suspension period of meetings to keep the lodge in the direction it needs to go. Thank you very much, brother. Good night, brothers. Thank you, Worshipful Brother. And finally, Worship Brother Christopher Murphy. Sir, the floor is yours for any final comments that you would like to make. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Worship Master. Uh, I, I guess just two very quick things. One, it occurs to me now that I actually do have a fairly comprehensive introductory reading list um, that I'd be happy to email to you, Worshipful, if uh, any if you could maybe distribute it to the group, anyone else who might be interested for that. Uh, I was hard pressed to come up with anything off the top of my head, but then I remembered yeah, we do have such a list for the Grand Lodge of Vermont, so I'd be happy to share that as well. Um, but just in general, just wanted to again express my, my gratitude uh, for being asked to even be part of this. Uh, it's always uh, it's always very nice and always very flattering when someone uh, asks to for you to speak and to share your point of view and your perspective on things. And so uh, thank you to, to Lexington Lodge and the Rubicon Society for that opportunity. And thank you for all the brethren who were here tonight uh, listening on this. Certainly you probably had many other things you could have been doing, uh, but you chose to spend that time um, with me. And so thank you very much for that. It's always um, a great honor. So thank you, brethren. Well, the pleasure is all ours. And if you get that list to me, I will absolutely make sure that it is shared with the brothers uh, with the replay video on the YouTube uh, link in the description, as well as on our website. So if uh, when you get that to me, I'll make sure that everyone has a copy of that as well. Thank you. Uh, brothers and friends, at this time, I'd like for us all to take just a brief moment of silence to show our love and respect for any absent or sick brothers uh, who may be experiencing difficulty during this time in their lives. Let us always remember to offer a lending hand to our brothers and their family and friends uh, and be generous in our services to those in need. Worship brother, or I'm sorry, uh, brother Bob Heater, chaplain of Lexington Lodge Number One. Would you please uh, provide our closing devotion? Let us pray. Eternal God, Grand Architect, He who grants every good and perfect gift, having been blessed by our guiding, by your guiding presence during this study time together this evening, we now offer to you the results of what we have done. Your special blessings and relief are requested for our brothers, family members, and friends who may be in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other distress, especially those who have been affected during this time of widespread pandemic. We also ask that you watch over and protect our troops. Also protect those civil servants who are attempting to quell the unrest that we see on our streets around the country these last several evenings. We also ask your blessings and care for those who have fallen sick to the coronavirus. May we be guided and strengthened for our Masonic commitments. 
we again thank you for giving to us as observant Masons the principles of Freemasonry and that we are part of your work through the craft. May the grand architect of the universe always be our guide. Amen. So what it be. Thank you, Brother Chapman. Brother Combs, Junior Warden, Lexington Lodge Number 1, will you please provide the closing charge? Brethren and friends, we are now about to quit this sacred retreat of friendship and virtue to mix again with the world. Amidst its concerns and employments, forget not the duties you have heard so frequently inculcated and forcefully recommended in this meeting. Be diligent, prudent, temperate, and discreet. Remember that it is friend and we leave others you deem worthy and who shall need your assistance. Let the world observe how Masons and true friends love one another. These generous principles are to extend further. Every human being has a claim upon your kind offices. Do good unto all, recommended more especially unto the household of the faithful. By diligence in the duties of your respective callings, by liberal benevolence and diffuse of charity, by constancy and fidelity in your friendship, discover the beneficial and happy effects of this ancient Freemasonry and friendship. Let it not be supposed that you have labored here in vain and spent your strength for naught. For your true work is with the Lord and your recompense with God. Finally, brethren and friends, be ye all of one mind, live in peace, and may the God of love and peace delight to dwell with and bless you. Thank you, Brother Junior Warden. And for those of you that uh, uh, are curious about our opening and closing charges, we deliver the opening and closing charge at Lexington Lodge Number 1 at every tiled meeting. And again, this is not a tiled meeting. And this version of the opening and closing charge is modified slightly for the online audience and for brothers as well as non-brothers in Freemasonry. I just want to thank everybody once again who attended and participated this evening and a very special thanks to Worshipful Brother Chris Martin. If anyone wishes to invite other brothers to future meetings or if you know of men personally who have expressed an interest in Freemasonry in your lodge and your jurisdiction, please go ahead and ask them the RSVP at Lexington Lodge number one and they can simply put your name down as, uh, as a referral. Thank you to everyone for attending, your commitment to your brothers, your commitment to your lodges, and most importantly, your commitment to Freemasonry. May we always be happy to meet, sorry to part, and happy to meet again. You are dismissed with my thanks and very warm fraternal regards. See everyone next Monday. Have a great night.